Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Marvelous season of the year, isn't it? I love the Christmas carols. They give us so much excellent theology concerning the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, who He is, how God broke into history, how God has provided for us redemption through a plan that no man could have ever come up with, a plan to come to earth himself as a baby. Incredible. Well, tonight we are looking at the spirit of the serpent. Spirit of the serpent. Acts chapter 16, looking at verses 16 through 22 tonight. We've been having a lot of interruptions because of all the special events that are going on. Uh, last week, of course, we had our fifth Sunday special with the film Veil of Tears, which was about missions to women in India. Two weeks ago, on November 23rd, we had Key Women in the Gospel. And that really is where we need to pick up because Acts 16 gives to us a contrast between two different women. We find Lydia first mentioned in verses 11 through 15 and her response to the Gospel. And then we find a demon-possessed woman given to us in Acts 16 through 22 and her response to the Gospel. Very interesting as you compare and contrast these two different women. You recall back in verses 11 and following, as Paul heads out again on his missionary journey, he goes to Philippi, the chief city of that part of Macedonia, a colony, and we were in that city abiding certain day. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city by the riverside where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized, and her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us, and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. You recall back in verses 11 and 12, we started with the very important principle that when you know God's will, you need to start moving. Active, obedient response, and that's what we find with Paul. They started moving as soon as they determined the target goal. They didn't vote on it they got moving. They didn't seek a second opinion. They got moving. It was exactly opposite what they thought they were going to do, but they got moving. As always, they headed to the largest city in that area, that region, which happened to be in this case Philippi. We've already looked at Paul's uh, method of uh, going about his evangelistic work, where he would go to a city, but here in this city he couldn't do it. It was strangely different, no synagogues, apparently. And God didn't lead him to a particular man. Instead, he's in the city for some days and discovers that there doesn't seem to be any man. God told him to go, he went, and now all he can find after a number of days of looking around is a group of women down by the riverside who gather there for prayer. And you recall we learned six different principles as we looked at that. Number one, don't insist that God always has to do things your way because God is not obligated to do things our way or the way that seems most comfortable to us. God is creative. He is not a machine. And God is dealing with specifically chosen, totally different people, every one of whom is very precious to him. The second thing that we learned is don't insist that God must always do things the same way that he's always done it before. And we talk about the seven last words of the church. We never did it that way before. Principle number three was the book of Acts, as we have noted over and over and over again since we began this series, is the expanse of the gospel. And we talked about that briefly this morning. We move from Jewish men in Acts 2 to Samaritan men and women in Acts 8 to a Gentile by birth Jewish convert black eunuch in Acts 8, the end of the chapter, to a fully Gentile family, and now we move to a female head of the household here in Acts chapter 16. 
Principle number four was you go where the people are that are most likely to respond. And so you have to start where there's an opening, no matter how small that opening is. And that's what Paul did. The fifth principle we learned was don't be so stuck on your highly developed strategies that have always worked that you fail to modify your strategy to accomplish the next step in God's plan for your life. We need to be flexible. That is one of the most difficult things I have discovered anyway in the American church. It's uh, not quite that way when you get overseas and I've been in a number of countries overseas. Uh, there's a great deal more flexibility but here in America we are rigid in terms of always doing it the same way. Don't be stuck on our highly developed strategies that have always worked. We need to learn to, when necessary, modify our strategies to accomplish the next step in God's plan for our lives. And then the sixth principle that we learned was don't drag your feet when God gives you a target. Oh, how easy it is for us, and we all tend to be procrastinators, dragging our feet. Instead, we should start moving the direction God wants us to go, even if we don't have all the information. Take the information you've got. Move forward with the information you've got. God will bless it. God will give you the direction at the time that you need the direction. The second major observation that we looked at last week was that a building is not needed for corporate prayer. And um, theologically, after the destruction of the temple, that would seem like a very obvious given because the temple was the focus of Jewish life but now uh, you know we're looking at a, a time and period where there is just a whole lot of chaos going on and um, certainly by the time we get down to the 21st century uh, we should have learned that lesson as you have seen the church destroyed over and over again in many many countries all around the world and buildings being pulled down even here at tonight as we speak churches in Muslim countries, churches in communist countries uh, the buildings are being pulled down but that is not what makes the church nor is that what will stop the church the third observation that we saw last week is apparently there was no organized teaching going on and we don't know how much contact those women had with the truth of scripture but there were no men there teaching none certainly mentioned in the text here and to have a Jewish synagogue you had to have at least 12 men to form it so there were none when Paul got there just a group of women we learn never give up in prayer we learn no matter who you are your prayers are important to God we learn God can give you above and beyond all that you ask or think I mean all these passages or all these principles are taught in this passage we learn number four that no matter who you are God can use you after he gives you what is best God used Lydia to establish a home base for Paul's outreach we learned that this humble beginning was the start of the church at Philippi. And we have the book of Philippians as a result of a woman's prayer meeting down by a riverside. And perhaps Philippians is one of the most joyful, joyful books in the entire Bible. And then Philippians chapter 4 had some of the most beloved verses, and we read quite a few of those last week. We'll not go through those again. But you recall how many fascinating and important verses are found verses out of every one of all four chapters there. We saw that it was a women's prayer group where all of that got started. We saw that it was the Philippians that Paul wrote about two women in the church who were apparently at odds with one another and mentioned other women also. When he wrote back to Philippi he talked about Euodius and Syntyche and encouraged them to be of the same mind. So the church with some powerful women in it. I think it was clear from verse 3 that God did eventually raise up some men in the church because Clement is mentioned and fellow helpers, masculine, are mentioned. So don't be discouraged by the lack of men in the church. Even here in this place, God can raise them up in his time. And then we learned that those women clearly supported Paul financially. Lydia was a businesswoman because she was a seller of purple. It tells us that specifically in the text, and God doesn't stick things in that are extraneous and not important. Very important that God stuck that into the text. That's a very expensive reddish-blue dye that we talked about that uh, colored the clothing that very rich people wore, and kings wore, and princes wore. Uh, people who were people of means. It was a very difficult dye to obtain and to make. It comes from a small murex. Uh, mollusk and um, Lydia was apparently at least by implication very industrious if she went to all the hard work necessary to produce that dye and so what she was meeting with 
in that culture were probably other women of the same social class, which would have been the upper uh, business class section of the city of Philippi. So we learned quite a bit just by that one phrase that she was a seller of purple. So God had a reason for sending Paul to that group of women because these were women who could support Paul's ministry financially. And they very clearly played a key role in the church at Philippi, which was the central hub of Macedonia. And then we're going to get a little bit later to one of the most important stories in the New Testament, also taking place at Philippi, which is the Philippian jailer, and that wonderful verse down in verse 31. But tonight, we have the spirit of the serpent. Beginning back in verse 16 again, And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us, and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit. Interesting. He didn't address the woman. He addressed the spirit behind the woman. He said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates ran off their clothes and commanded to beat them. Now that certainly was a kangaroo court, a quick trial, no witnesses present. We find ad hominem arguments all the way through that uh, accusation there. We find racist arguments against these men. And so it was assumed that no other argument would be needed. So we set this passage in contrast with the godly woman who responded properly to the gospel when she heard versus the demon-possessed woman who clearly understands the gospel and mockingly rejects it. A head knowledge is not what is necessary for salvation. The demon inside the woman knew who Paul and his traveling companions were. She didn't come up and say, by the way, you know, you guys sort of look funny what is it that you have to say? Really, that's what you believe? No, the demon already knew. The very first encounter with this woman, the demon already knew. The word demon comes from an ancient Semitic root, da, which means to know. The demons are the ones that practice gathering knowledge. You know, there are demons who know everything about you all the way from your birth all the way to the present time. All the stuff you've ever done. They're gathering it. They're going to use it against you. They do use it against you. They try to arrange situations now that they know your weaknesses. They try to arrange situations to put you in so that you will fall into the petty sins or the carnal sins or whatever the big sins are in your life because they have seen a pattern. Demonic forces are everywhere in the world. It's a huge number of fallen angels, one-third of the entire heavenly host, which is, in human terms, innumerable. And their goal is to try to destroy you. The demon in this woman already knew who Paul was. Some other interesting things we see here. When we see this contrast, the first lesson we learn is the same message invokes different responses in different people. Paul brought that message to Lydia and it says the Holy Spirit opened her heart. Didn't just open her brain, opened her heart. She responded properly to the message. The demon-possessed woman knew the message too but she responded in a different manner. Have you ever wondered why certain people 
respond to the gospel when you share it with them and are excited about it and other people don't? You have a good illustration right here in the text as to what's going on. You are in a spiritual battle. And the closer we get to the return of Christ, the more intense the battle becomes and the more you will find that vicious opposition to the gospel raising its ugly head. Secondly, Satan brought his attack against Paul's entourage while they were engaged in spiritual activity. You know, when we're engaged in carnal activity, Satan doesn't care. While we're engaged in just sort of muddling through life, the devil doesn't care. We're not doing anything for Jesus. Satan attacked them while they were engaged in spiritual activity. It says, while they were going to prayer. Not while they were engaged in some kind of fool activity. They were, you know, not busy at the shop trying to bargain for apples. They were on their way to prayer. The third thing that we see in this passage is that Paul and his company did not just accidentally run across this woman. Did you catch that as we read through it? They didn't just accidentally run across the woman. It says she met them. Now, when you go to meet somebody, it means you have a purpose in going to meet them. She met them. You know, Satan is on the lookout for Christians who are involved in spiritual activity. And when he finds you involved in spiritual activity, expect that he's going to confront you. It will happen. And he will confront you with the most obnoxious, and most distasteful things possible to try to get you sidetracked. You know, if, if it's just a little thing, you know, you can just keep on like a gnat kind of thing. You swat at it and you keep on heading towards your goal. But if a bear comes out of the woods at you, do you think you might be distracted from the goal you're trying to reach? When you are involved in spiritual activity, expect a major attack from the devil. We see this kind of thing happening all the way through the book of Acts and we're going to compare and contrast a number of different occurrences where the apostles in their ministry run into specific demon-possessed people involved in witchcraft and spiritually wicked activity trying to stop the message of the gospel. This is just one of the many. Uh, we'll talk about the comparisons a little bit later, the Lord willing. Did you notice also number four? The woman was persistent. Oh my, was she persistent. As soon as her demonic radar locked on to Paul, she began to follow him. It says she followed them. She didn't just stand next to her fortune-telling booth, and as Paul and his company went by, started screaming, These are the guys that show us the way of salvation. Hey, yeah, you see? Hey, all you people, look, there they go, there they go. It says she followed them. How would you like to be walking through town? And somebody grins at you, walks up to you, begins a tirade, and then think about it, walking down through Collingswood. <laughs> you're walking down past the pop shop. You're walking back down past Barry's Tile and Floor. You're walking down past the municipal building and the mayor is coming out and people are there on the sidewalk. And somebody is following you, screaming and hollering about your Christianity. Would you feel embarrassed? I think so. I would feel embarrassed. She's in the middle of the biggest city in the area. They're walking through town and she follows them all the way down to the river where they're going for prayer. She followed them. That's kind of persistent. Imagine that scenario. Not much privacy, no peace, not much sanity. You got the stares of the crowd. You hear the laughing, you hear the mocking, just because you're trying to find a place to pray. She was not only persistent in following them, but did you notice it said that she met them day after day. She did the same thing day after day. This wasn't just sort of a haphazard thing. You know, I think that might get on your nerves. It certainly get on my nerves. Think about it this way. If you were in that situation, you think to yourself, I was down on 2nd Avenue, and that's where I ran into this woman before. 
I don't think I'm going to take 2nd Avenue today. I think I'll go over to Madison and Park and uh, walk down to the river that way. I'll make a big loop going out of the way. And you know what? It didn't matter which way they went. She was waiting. Satan knows where you are. The demons know where you are. Now, we don't have to be afraid because we have the Holy Spirit, but the devil makes it his business to know. He knows where you are. He knows what you're doing. The devil is Santa Claus, if you will. He knows when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. <laughs> yeah, we ascribe to Santa those character qualities that actually belong to God, but Satan has some character qualities about knowing because his purpose is to destroy you. He wants to destroy the gospel message. He wants to stop Paul in his tracks. He doesn't want the gospel to get out of Philippi. He knows that's an important city. He has seen the method that Paul has used before. He has seen how Paul has gone to these major cities, spread the gospel, and then it's beginning to spread from there, and Satan doesn't like that. So he's going to put a, a squelch on it if he possibly can. So no matter which street they took, she was there waiting for them. Just remember, when Satan decides to track you down, he doesn't give up. It says she tracked them many days, not two or three days, many days. Remember, Paul was there at Philippi trying to get a work started. And he'd been there for quite a while before he even found the ladies down by the river. And now he's trying to make a beachhead, and Satan doesn't want him to make a beachhead. I think, in this case, most of us would have given up. You know, nothing in the text indicates that people came to Christ as a result of the demonic activity. A testimony. The woman is telling the truth. That's point number five. The woman told the truth. She had the correct message. Look at verse 17. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, and that's, she screamed, saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God. Now, is that true? They were the servants of the Most High God. And then she added to it, which show unto us the way of salvation. Hey, folks, you want to get saved? Hey, over there, you who are lost, you guys that are gambling over there on the pavement. Hey, how about you drunkard over there in the gutter? You want to get saved? Think about that. I mean... Wouldn't it be nice to have some bold Christians out there trying to drag the drunks out of the gutters? Wouldn't it be some nice to have some bold Christians out there reaching into the casinos down in Atlantic City? Wouldn't it be nice to have some bold Christians who are not so scared of their own shadow that they actually hand a track to somebody? Well, wouldn't it seem, wow, that's great. you got this lady out there and she's actually speaking the truth and she's not ashamed to do it, man. And everybody knows who she is. I mean, after all, she made her masters a lot of money. It says, much gain. Now, she wasn't just a, a second-rate kind of a fortune teller. I mean, she was the real McCoy. Oh, I'm sorry, Keith. <laughs> she, she, was, she was really the thing, you know. People knew that she could tell them their fortunes, and it would happen. But, you know, it doesn't seem like through that so-called preaching, anybody came to Christ. Why? I think the answer is this. Satan knows that one of the most effective ways to counter the message of truth is to blunt it by shouting it through the lips of some weirdo whose persona is already questionable, tacky, outrageous, lunatic fringe, bizarre, weirdly dressed, obnoxious, or mentally off base. Some of you have known people like this. I'm sure you have. And you think, man, I don't want to be associated with them. Well, what's Satan doing? He's putting somebody out there who's speaking the truth, but it's somebody who everybody when they hear the truth from that person, either shrug it off or laugh or scorn or decide, we're not going to listen to that one. And if she's associated with them, 
we sure don't want to have anything to do with them. Satan is a master schemer. We see that happening here. God doesn't need weird, demon-possessed people witnessing for Jesus. When demon-possessed people started screaming with who Jesus was in the Gospels, and there are many occurrences of this, where some demon began to cry out, you are the Christ, the Son of God, what did Jesus do? He told them to shut up. Jesus doesn't need demon-possessed people to be his witnesses. He didn't commission the demon-possessed people to run around and tell others about Jesus. Who did he commission? Acts chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. You're my witnesses. You're going to give this message. You, who are believers in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and under the uttermost parts of the earth. God doesn't have to rely on demon-possessed people to get the gospel message out. He's given it to us. That's an important point. That takes us all the way back to chapter 1 as to who is supposed to be the witnesses. Paul is doing it, but he doesn't need the help of this woman either. Jesus just told those people to shut up and then he told the demon to come out of that possessed person. By the way, in the Gospels, you find demon-possessed people in very super-religious settings. Have you ever noticed that? You know, Satan is not only an imitator, he is an infiltrator. Let me give you a couple of illustrations. In fact, it's the same incident, but two in different Gospels. Mark chapter 1, verse 23. There was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. Now, you know, it seems to me, I mean, humanly speaking or humanly thinking, that a demon-possessed person would want to stay as far away as possible, in this case from a synagogue, the church hadn't been started yet, he'd want to stay away from the synagogue. And it would seem to me that, at least humanly thinking, a demon-possessed person wouldn't want to be in the context of Christians who are worshiping God. But we find here a demon-possessed man in the synagogue a man who had an unclean spirit. He was not only there, but it says he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Was the demon speaking the truth? Yep. And was he speaking it in a synagogue? Yep. In a worship service? Yep. God doesn't need the testimony of the devil. And so what did, it, what did Jesus do? It says, Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. In other words, shut up and get out. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. You know, there were all kinds of exorcists at the time of Christ, even as there are exorcists now, but there are Jewish exorcists, and we see some of those in the book of Acts. Uh, seven sons of Sceva, one of the priests, and they were trying to do some exorcism, and that means that they had memorized certain formulas to which demons usually would respond. And when they would do their hocus-pocus and say their little formulas, they were doing exorcisms. And, you know, even in the Catholic Church today, they exercise houses and they exercise cars and they exercise clothing and uh, exorcise, not exercise, to get rid of the demons and all the bad things there are. If somebody has died in the house, the priest will come and, you know, exercise the house. Same type of stuff that the seven sons of Sceva were trying to do. But you recall that case when the unclean spirit took a look at them through that demon-possessed man. He said, Jesus I know. The demon knew Jesus. And Paul I know. The demon knew Paul. But who are ye? And it says the man in whom the unclean spirit was leaped on them, beat them up, ripped all their clothes off, 
and they fled out of the house naked. That's not the kind of thing you want to get involved in. Demon-possessed people show up in religious settings. That exact same text is found over in Luke chapter 4, verses 33 through 36. In the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. Shut up and get out. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and hurt him not. And they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commandeth the unclean spirits, and they come out. Now, what lesson do we learn from that? I think it's a very important lesson. Persistence, telling the truth, telling it publicly, telling it loudly, having a specified target audience are not guarantees that people will come to Christ or that the gospel will take effect. All those things were true of this demon-possessed woman here. What it takes is not all of that methodology. What it takes is the Spirit of God, not the tactics of the world or the flesh or the devil. The next observation I think that we see here in the passage is also instructive. It says, the woman had a spirit of divination this fortune-telling stuff. Very interesting when you look at that word divination in the Greek text. It literally says she had a spirit of python. Have you ever heard of a python? You know what a python is? <laughs> Would you like to be embraced by a python? I don't think so. You know about those gigantic snakes like boa constrictors and anacondas? Do you know where they got their name Python? It came from the demonic source of that great serpent, the devil. This is the only place in the New Testament where that word Python is used. According to Greek mythology, the Python was a serpent destroyed by Apollo, who was hence called Pythias. You've sometimes heard that name and you wonder, I thought we were talking about Apollo. I mean, if you've read any Greek mythology, I used to read a lot of Greek mythology. Um, very interesting kind of stuff because you see all these glimmers, little glimmers of truth where you know that these people at one time had the truth and then they perverted it. Paul says that same thing over in Romans chapter 1. If you go back to Noah, they had the truth. But as people spread out over all the world, the truth began to get manipulated. The truth began to get perverted and changed. People forgot certain elements and added certain elements to make it more exciting. That's where all this mythology came from. And you've got it in every culture of the world, but you've got certain elements that you can still see in all those cultures. Okay, Apollos was called Pythias. The priestess at the famous temple at Delph was called the Pythoness, the female snake. Through her, the oracle was delivered. The term Python became equivalent to a soothsaying demon. The term that is used in modern witchcraft is she was a medium. You ever heard of a medium? Yeah. Normally a woman, but with contact with the demonic spirit who knows something about you so that as you come into her tent, for her to read your palm or gaze into her crystal ball, the demonic spirit is telling her certain things about you. And so then she repeats those things and you say, wow, how did this woman know this? She can tell you your name as you walk in the door without ever you having uttered it from your lips. She can tell you the name of your parents. She can tell you the name of your brothers and sisters. She can tell you the day on which you were born. She can tell you activities that have happened in your life. Because there's a network of demonic forces around the world and they communicate one with another. The devil's not omnipresent, but he has a huge network, a very quickly communicating network. And his goal is to destroy you as a Christian. His goal is to attack you whenever you are doing spiritual things. The term <coughs> Python fits with the term soothsaying, which is in this same verse here. 
That's mantuomai, is the word that's translated soothsaying. That's the demonic activity of fortune telling. Many forms are found in modern witchcraft. We've mentioned a couple, palm reading and crystal balls, but also tarot cards, tea leaf readings, and many others. And you recall I did a whole series on witchcraft um, months and months and months ago, earlier when we were in the Book of Acts. So you stay away from it. Demons know things about you because they follow you just like the woman in our passage tonight, except the demons are invisible and she was not. Point number nine. There is money in witchcraft. It tells us here in the text she brought much money to her masters back in verse 16. The world is not afraid of the demonic supernatural as long as it satisfies their greed. But touch their money bag and you'll go to jail. That's what happened here in this passage and we'll see Paul in jail and Silas in jail in just a little bit. Number 10, remember some of the demonic encounters previously in the book of Acts. For example, back in Acts chapter 8, Acts is a book of supernatural warfare. We have a lot to learn and much to remember. Demonically controlled people often show up at critical junctures in the life of the church. Expect it here. Just like the demon-possessed man in the synagogue in Acts 8, we learned some things. We learned a principle. We learned that when you're in leadership, expect to immediately step up to the plate and face the battle when the man ahead of you is taken out of the game. What happened when Stephen was taken out of the game and Philip immediately had to face demonic forces? Every man has a different amount of time to fight the good fight of faith. You don't know when your time is going to end. You need to be involved in spiritual warfare every day. You do that by the way you spend time in prayer by the courage that you have in boldly witnessing to those who are around you, your neighbors, your friends, those at your workplace. You'll discover that when you begin to do these things, you will get opposition. But it is what we're called to do. It is the most important thing we're called to do. We are to live for Christ. We are to witness for Christ. We are to be His examples here in this world. The devil will always try to eliminate the leaders. That's another principle that we learned there. So be ready when your time comes. Philip was successful in different ways than Stephen in his successes. Stephen's the one who got eliminated. Philip's the one who gets to carry on and continue. Stephen was an apologist. Philip was an evangelist. Stephen had the gift of miracles, that is supernatural powers, but he was killed. Philip performed supernatural miracles, casting out many demons and multiple healings, and he was not killed. Stephen faced evil Jewish leaders and false witnesses under the direct control of Satan himself. Philip faced a single evil Samaritan sorcerer and multiple people who were demon-possessed. Just like God doesn't always do same thing in the same way every time, neither does the devil. He's a strategist. We saw that when we were in Acts 8, three different words were used for Stephen's supernatural gifts for which he was killed. We saw the word power, that's dunamis, dynamic power, explosive power, power capable of reproducing itself, that irresistible actual power with focus on the internal nature of the power, like life inside of a seed. We find Satan can counterfeit dunamis. Just remember that. We saw a second word was used, wonders, teras, that which causes amazement. The focus there is on the effect of the mind of the person who sees the action performed. It shuts their mouths, stops them dead in their tracks. Satan's also capable of doing that. It affects the minds of people. Do you realize how easy it's going to be for the Antichrist and the false prophet during the tribulation period to get people to worship the image of the beast. They're capable of counterfeiting these miracles and these wonders. The third word translated miracles is semeon, a sign. That which authenticates the message of the messenger. That word is used 48 times in the Gospels of Christ's miracles. It's used to describe the eight messianic signs that prove Jesus is the Messiah in the Gospel of John. 
John never uses the term dunamis. He uses teros only once, but he uses semeon 17 times when speaking of the miracles of Christ. That's why Satan counterfeits the miraculous gifts because he wants people to believe his demonic doctrine. That's why the test today always must be scripture, not the dunamis, not the teras, or semeon of someone proclaiming a message which is contrary to the Bible. We see all three of those words occurring in the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, which explains the purpose. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness, both with, and here are the three words, with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Folks, it's a spiritual battle. That's what Paul is experiencing here in Philippi. He's going into new territory which Satan has firmly controlled. He's beginning to break ground. He's beginning to plant seed. And there's a group of women that are watering the seed with their prayers. And Satan isn't happy about it. There's so much more we can say on that subject. We're beginning to run out of time here. Let me skip over a couple of things. <clears throat> We find in the New Testament that there are different types of miracles as well as healings. Paul does a miracle here where he casts a demon out of this woman and makes her totally unuseful for Satan's further purposes or for the purposes of her masters. Satan's purpose was to stop the gospel. Her master's purpose was to make money. Satan uses people for his purposes even though they think they have a different purpose. Sometimes Satan uses believers who have wrong purposes to accomplish his demonic goals. The believer may not even know that they're being used that way but because they are motivated by one of those deadly sins that we talked about Satan is able to use them to accomplish his goals. We need to be careful because in the spiritual warfare we are faced on a daily basis with demonic forces around us who know who we are, who know what tempts us, who know where our spiritual weaknesses are and where our spiritual strengths are, and they never attack you in your area of strength. They're going to come at you where you're weak. That's what's happening here in this passage. Well, I had a lot more here about the difference between healings and miracles, but I think I'm going to skip that. But the important thing that we need to learn out of those passages early in Acts that apply to our passage here in Acts chapter 16 is these miraculous sign gifts and this ability of the Apostle Paul to cast out demons, and you're not to be involved in that kind of stuff, they were not for personal use. Those gifts didn't even always protect the people who had them from harm. Paul had all the gifts, but as we see here at the end of this chapter, Paul also suffered horrible abuse. He gets thrown into jail. He gets beaten just because he had every one of the spiritual gifts, and he says so in other passages, didn't mean that he escaped suffering. When you're involved in spiritual warfare, there are casualties. Paul eventually suffered death by beheading. Back to our text. Two women. There are some key women in the Gospels. Those are the women who responded properly to the witness of the Apostle Paul at Philippi. But Satan always raises up a counter-terrorist, if you will, a terrorist who will come in and counter the gospel. 
what is it that you are following what is it to you are looking to what it is you are relying upon for your strength Satan's going to give you a duplicate but he's going to give it to you from the opposite position a ministry among women there's going to be a woman who causes the trouble ministry among men there's going to be a man who causes trouble ministry among couples there's going to be a couple that causes trouble ministry among families there's going to be a family that causes trouble have you seen that in the past here at this church I think so. I have certainly seen that. I've been in ministry now since 1973 in terms of full-time ministry, but I've been involved in ministry with my father ever since I was a little child. And I've seen that pattern over and over and over and over again in the churches where first he served and then where I served. We have much to learn from Acts chapter 16. Well, I think I'm going to stop there rather than getting into the next big section. We have a lot of other things we want to say about this passage, but Lord willing, we'll do that next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even through the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Father, we pray that you will examine our hearts with the Word of God, the light of Scripture. All those things that we think are so deeply hidden, and perhaps we at least theologically know that you know about them, but since you haven't done anything, we just keep on doing them. and We keep doing them in secret. Help us to understand there's an evil network that is designed to destroy the believers. One of their goals is to keep the world in darkness, but one of their goals is also to try to destroy the light that believers are bringing. Help us, Father, never to be the kind of smudge pot that gives off very little light, but mostly smoke. Help us to be instead blazing torches that hold forth the gospel of Christ. But as the light is held forth, the evil animals of the dark forest begin to surround it and will do everything they can to get to the one who's holding the light. Make us faithful, make us courageous, make us diligent, make us wise, that we might hold forth the gospel of Christ in a way that most perfectly pleases our Lord and Savior, the one to whom we must someday give an account. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.